All right, cool. So, uh, yeah, so I'm Jacob. I do uh, governance research with Tezos. Uh, and so I'm presenting you um, sort of our, uh, you know, purist uh, philosophic take on what, uh, how, how we think about governance and, you know, like how, how, the, how basically where did the project come from? How does it work? Um, and then, uh, you know, what, what are some of the things we're looking to do uh, to improve it? Uh, so uh, going to the, you know, just to give a brief uh, overview of Tezos. So it's a base layer blockchain. It aims to be a base layer blockchain protocol uh, for, you know, smart contracts and uh, dApps. Uh, written in, the, the core protocol is written in OCaml. Uh, uses a, and it has a, a domain-specific language for uh, smart contracts called uh, Mickelson. Uh, and this is uh, designed to facilitate formal verification. So it was created by a bunch of formal methods experts in, in, in Paris. Uh, and so that it, it takes that tack uh, towards smart contracts. Uh, then it, it, the proof of stake uh, mechanism, uh, the consensus algorithm uh, allocates uh, block publishing and endorsements rights uh, based on proof of stake. Uh, as well as governance rights based on stake in the in the early days, uh, and it has a multi-stage uh, on-chain governance mechanism for coordinating uh, token holders around protocol upgrades. So, what does that look like? Looks like an octopus. So, the, you have Tezos is actually three protocols. Uh, there's sort of the network protocol, and then you have the transaction protocol and the consensus protocol. The network shell, uh, which is the octopus here, uh, doesn't care about what the, the transaction and consensus protocols are, uh, which are basically the, the protocol, um, the, the, the green eye uh, here in the middle. And this mechanism, ba this, this architecture basically allows Tezos to easily implement changes to uh, the transaction and consensus protocols uh, based on what, how stakeholders uh, basically uh, coordinate around different you know proposals and, and, and upgrades, uh, and just to just to give you guys an a, a bit, you know an overview of how uh, proof of stake works in Tezos, uh, we call it, you know we have a sort of this emerging consensus around this idea of uh, that it should be called liquid proof of stake. Uh, basically, it as I said, it allocates uh, block publishing and endorsement rights uh, for what we call baking. It's a French project, uh, yeah, you know, to uh, you know for consensus. Uh, and it's liquid because uh, any user can transfer uh, baking rights to other users who are participating in consensus, or known as bakers. Uh, and, it, and it basically, you know, assigns these slots to rolls of 10,000 XTZ, uh, and you know, and that's an amount that that barrier to entry can be can be lowered via the on-chain mechanism. Uh, but the big big thing here is that delegation in Tezos is not about. Uh, you know, when you transfer your baking rights, it's not for the purposes of, of scalability, like something like uh, EOS. Uh, it's actually for incentive alignment. It's actually so that people who have large stakes and people who have small stakes get diluted roughly around the same amount. Um, and, and so basically, let's look at how it's operating in the wild. Uh, we have about 440 unique bakers at this point uh, across 25 countries uh, who are pre, you know, set prepared to bake uh, should they be called upon in uh, cycle 38. Uh, which is in a few weeks. Uh, and there's 66 public Tezos delegation services, uh, at least on mytezosbaker.com, uh, as of uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, and the fees generally range from about 5 to 20%. Usually I see around 10%. I haven't, uh, I need to dive in and see what the, the uh, you know, weighted average is. Uh, but 56% of tokens are set, are, you know, are set to participate in baking uh, in cycle 38. Very exciting. Um, and, and I think uh, once we have better ledger, ledger integration, uh, you know, the, the user interface for it is better, uh, and there's a number of other infrastructure efforts that start to take off, um, I think baking will become much easier and, and, you know, have much wider adoption. So the current governance mechanism uh, is basically this four-quarter governance mechanism. Essentially, uh, you know, you, you a baker, you know, proposes a protocol amendment uh, as a hash of the tarball uh, of a .ml file representing a new protocol. Uh, and they do, they basically all the bakers do a round of approval voting to rank the proposals. Uh, votes are weighted by stake. Uh, bakers vote on the top ranked uh, amendment proposal. If they, if they reach an 80% quorum, and then this is including people who you can you know, actively, excuse me, uh, ex abstain, and then uh, that counts towards the quorum. Uh, and then this quorum can dynamically adjust based on past participation. Uh, and if 80% vote yes, then the proposal is upgraded to a testnet. There's this testnet period. Uh, based on how it does in a testnet, hopefully that's how they're evaluating it, the bakers will uh, you know, vote a second time to upgrade uh, you know, this testnet, um, the, you know, from the testnet uh, you know, proposal to you know, the, the running that as the main net. They, they basically, they, they're, this whole time they're running both and they switch to the new one, to the, the new one that had been on the testnet if they, after, if they can pass an 80% quorum and an 80% supermajority. 
Uh, but but the, the big thing is, you know, and there's been a lot of, uh, and I think rightly, a lot of concern around you know, plutocracy and the idea that, you know, if you have a lot of tokens, you have a big say in this process. Uh, but the point of this is not to enshrine voting as the main or the only governance mechanism in Tezos. The, whole, the, whole, the coolest thing about Tezos, in my opinion, um, is that you can actually, that it's not just about co coming to consensus about, um, you know, the blocks, about, about the state of the protocol, um, the state of the blockchain. Um, basically, it's also about coming to consensus about, uh, you know, the, uh, how, the, how the protocol should be governed as well. So you can actually, you can change the, the governance mechanism itself through this process. Uh, and so there's two possible ways I see this being improved in the, in the near future. Uh, one would be to tinker with the existing vo voting mechanism, allow token holders to switch delegates. So if you're a, a token holder delegating to one baker, uh, you'd be allowed to move delegates before the end of the, the voting cycle and you'd be before the vote is tallied, basically. And so this increases, theoretically increases the accountability of delegates. Uh, but the, the se second idea that, you know, that's pretty popular uh, in, in the Tesla community, at least as I've uh, seen it, is um, that, you know, this idea of separating baking, you know, consensus and voting entirely. Uh, and this, the, the idea here is that you would allow token holders to delegate their, their baking rights to one party and their voting rights to another. Maybe you have someone locking up a bunch of tokens uh, and you delegate your voting rights uh, to that person uh, instead of you know, your, your baker. But I, I, and I think that's a compelling idea and I think there's a lot of arguments for it and we need to think about it more. Uh, but I think, I think one way that you could do it that would be really cool is if you make the default to give both keys, both like the key to voting, the key to baking at the same time, but allow people to move the voting key to somebody else if they want. Um, so you'd have better token participation, um, but and, and, you know you wouldn't. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily have to pay any attention, and even have to figure out like who are the good people to you know the the, the people that they want to align their votes with. Um, you know, given that everyone is you know sort of has similar incentive alignment, um, but I think it would be good for accountability. And then you have uh, this really cool idea, uh, Arthur uh, Brightman, the creator, one of the creators of Tezos. Um, he has this idea. You know, he's always really been obsessed with futarchy. Um, but basically, there's a lot of implementation options here, uh, and blockchains are like kind of the ideal testing ground because you know there's not a lot. Uh, you know, currently, like yes, there's a, you know a lot at stake that some of these you know some protocols have very large market caps and whatnot. But there's ways that we can test uh, some of you know some of these implementations uh, in the wild without. Um, you know that you know putting that much at stake. You know whether it's over small decisions or it's in you know in a limited context. There's a lot of really cool things we can test here. Um, and and one of the coolest things is that you can actually fund market making for these uh, few target mechanisms in protocol and actually uh, use a small dose of inflation to subsidize discovery of uh, you know say ideas that might um, you know that basically to, to subsidize people to go out and figure out if if a proposal is a good idea. Uh, but full, few, full futarchy is untested, you know, and it's probably undesirable. Uh, you know, it's hard to incorporate, um, no, you know, norms and normative, you know, different value, you know, and value systems in, inside of a futarchy mechanism. So the idea is like, you know, probably a good idea would be to basically have a futarchy mechanism that ranks the proposals um, instead of maybe using the approval vote in the first uh, cycle of that, that first quarter of, of uh, Tezos governance. Um, but we need to do a lot more testing on this. And there's two, two other really cool things that, that are, uh, there's another really cool thing here, uh, you know, constitutionalism, and there's two uh, main approaches to this, and, and we're talking about programmatic, uh, you know, uh, constitutionalism, not the EOS, you know, you stamp a constitutional, you know, constitution on, on something and you say that it's, it's binding. Um, this is, uh, you know, actually, like, you know, programmatically enforced. It's basically like, you know, um, you know, you'd have a shell-based, uh, you know, constitutional, where basically you wrap the existing protocol in another shell, uh, and you specify which aspects can be changed or amended uh, by protocol amendments. Uh, and then you, you could, what's cool here is that you can actually set higher, lower thresholds for different types of decisions. So if somebody puts out a proposal, they want to change account balances, they want to redistribute tokens from one person's uh, you know, account to another, you can say no, or you can say, you know, this is never allowed, or you can say you have to have 95% of tokens backing this, um, which would be very, very hard to coordinate. Um, so there, there's, and you can see different scenarios where this would be a pretty good idea, especially uh, like later in the lives of blockchains where, um, you know, there's definitely a greater interest in immutability. And then you can do an in-protocol proof checker. This is years away, uh, despite the fact that, you know, we have an army of formal methods experts working on Tezos. Um, you know, everyone says this is sort of something that's, that's nowhere near uh, ready. 
Um, so, and another big thing, um, you know, before I wrap up is, you know, Web 2.0, there's a really good line I heard uh, from someone actually from, I think it was from Parity, uh, talking about how, like, this notion of, like, Web 2.0 sites, that they shouldn't be governing Web 3. You know, this idea that we're building all these awesome protocols that are trying to solve the previous problems of the internet, you know, the, 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 inter the problems of the current internet, um, and all of a sudden we're resorting to things like Reddit and Riot and whatnot to, to adjudicate these discussions, you know, to, to structure these discussions. We should probably have a couple, you know, other ways of doing this. So one, one really, you know, cool way to do it would be to have some kind of stake-based discussion. What that means is, you know, you just have to put up some, you know, you just basically have to have proof of some amount of TES um, or lock up some amount of TES to participate in some discussion forum. Uh, or I know and the, you, the idea would be a very low amount. And then you could use, another thing that would be cool would be using something like Kialo. You know, one cool conversation I saw in there the other day was the, the conversation around should the electoral college be abolished? So they have experience talking about governance mechanisms. Um, and then to conclude, it's like what's the point of all this? Sorry for the, the crowded slide. Uh, so the key, the key thing is like trying to achieve you know de decentralized governance, basically give token holders the final say over how the protocol evolves, uh, and create the right creating the right choice of architecture really matters there. Uh, and then the bigger thing, the real, the really the purpose of Tezos, you know, all along has been to have long-term optionality and avoiding this notion of like not invented here. The idea that you know this at the end of the day, these are all open, you know, should probably be open source. Uh, protocols, um, and at the end of the day, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, there's no real competitive barriers that aren't governance or, or community based. Uh, and so the idea here is that you want to preserve optionality to be able to go with the, uh, the, the better tech or, you know, improve tech that improves your existing protocol, um, even if it wasn't created by your core devs. Um, and, and we think that official roadmaps give like way too much discretionary power to core developers. And what's really cool so far in Tezos is that you have a bunch of different really cool efforts already underway to do, you know, implement Avalanche on Tezos. You know, what about, you know, what about doing something like, I mean, Gun Syra Cornell, he's, you know, uh, working on sharding Tezos. Uh, he has multiple sharding, you know, ideas that his teams are working on. Uh, and then there's also Tezos, you know, Arthur Brightman always has to say you have like maybe doing something like Recursive Snarks, now made popular with uh, something like Coda. Uh, this can be implemented on Tezos as well. Um, and there's all sorts of awesome things that we'll be, you know, we'll discuss and we'll try to figure out what's best for, for the protocol. Um, and then uh, the, 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 the key, the wrap up, you know, the, the key point here that we're trying to make is that basically preserving and expanding network effects is as important as you know, picking the best technological approach. And so that's what we're trying to create the right environment for that. We're not trying to pick, you know, say from the get-go what that best approach is. Thank you.